Well, we are Still a Control Podcast, and we're here with a, a legend. That's a word that you can't use that many times in this building this weekend. But we're here with, if you don't know, this is Deborah Wilson of many fames. You might know her from Mad TV. You might see, you might have heard her voice in Wolfenstein. You may have heard her voice, seen her like this in a lot of games. You've seen her like this in Star Wars. Like it's so nervous. I'm not gonna hide it. So it's great to meet you. Thank you. And so First off, what brings you, what what brought you to voice acting? Was it, are you a gamer? It's not like it brought me to voice acting. People have a tendency to believe that um, uh, whether it's sketch comedy, whether it is um, improv, whether it's on camera, whether it's off camera, it's all storytelling. And we have a tendency to monetize it and then compartmentalize it by calling yourself a voice actor or an actor or a comedian right. or an improv person or a, or a television actor or a film actor. Because people tend to put like a hierarchy, right? A, 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 a hierarchy, but then also a separation of the craft. And the craft is really just storytelling. People who say like, you know what, this is what I want to do for life. This is what I want to do for a living is to tell stories. And there are all these different ways to tell them and all these different spaces to tell them in. So they're not any different and they're no less phenomenal and wonderful than what you bring to the table with your craft. Right. And so when voice acting, because it's a little different whenever, because, you know, as an actress on screen, people see you and that's you. But you've lent your likeness to most of the games you've been in. And so like the process of how is, for, for instance, I know how they map your face. They put a camera to you. How is that process? Does it feel separate from like when you're interacting with the cast how does that process feel whenever you are doing your lines you're doing all the motions all the acting and they're mapping your face how does that feel whenever you're in that setting is that any I'm not different? paying I'm not paying attention to that because at that point again in the storytelling you're paying attention to the relationships you're paying attention to the space that you're in and what you hold so the moment you have to think about that you're not in that space anymore okay it's like if you ever think about little children they don't go okay I'm gonna pretend to be this and I'm gonna stand here and I'm gonna say it this way and then I want you to say they like no I'm gonna be Batman you're gonna be Robin and so there is this reckless abandon to completely accept the space that you hold and just allow what is going to happen and how the relationship is going to build as Batman and Robin or if you're Joker and Batman and how that's going to happen. Kids play it out. They don't tell you as the Joker you have to say this and be this and as Batman I'm going to do this and you're going to say this. It's just a matter of how do we have this experience. As adults we keep delineating all of these things because you know we're beholden to something greater. A video game company, uh, you know, the production company, the game that was developed, the game developers, the writers. And I get all of that, but as performers in this and storytellers in this, that's where you take all of the stuff that is technical for them and begin to play and build, the play and build a playground. Right. So when it comes to motion capture and performer capture, it's like something you just get used to. If you want to scuba dive, you're going to take lessons and learn how to scuba dive underwater so that you can have a greater experience of the ocean, mm -hmm. the greater experience of the Great Barrier Reef, not a greater experience of scuba diving. Right. Like you know, the scuba diving is, is the journey to get to the beauty of what God has created underwater and the whole universe that exists there. And so you don't make it about the scuba diving. The scuba diving is, again, the vessel and the vehicle. So when it comes to all of those other things, when it comes to a booth, when it comes to performance capture, when it comes to an HMC, which is a head-mounted camera in performance capture, those things are par for the course so that you can continue to bridge that space and that space in the storytelling as an actor. So are you... Whenever you got into like your first role, are, were you uh, a gamer primarily? I was never a gamer. I was never a gamer. I grew up, I'm so old that the things that I played were Pong, you yeah, know? We, yeah, yeah <laughs> those things. Uh, I, I was never really a gamer. And if I had to play a game where I go like, okay, I can get obsessive about this, it would still be, believe it or not, pinball. I'm obsessed with pinball. So pinball is something that I would play. 
Because I like the interaction. I like the visual experience of it. Do the hip checks? Do you like, you know how like... No, <laughs> I'm really clear about not doing that. I really want to play with integrity when I play pinball. However, pinball has still evolved because a lot of the games that are out there, a lot of the TV shows that are out there, a lot of the movies that are out there have pinball games where it's interactive, where you're hearing part of the soundtrack, part of the music. The three speakers, uh, the graphics, yeah, it's, I've seen uh, the, uh, the video in it, in, you know, that's involved, you know, intense. the LEDs in it. It's just, um, it's intense. And so for me, that evolutionary process is still the flip side of the same coin of the evolutionary process of games. Because as soon as a game comes out, the cinematics are made into a film. They're right. put in sequence. Why? Because for those that don't play the game, the cinematics are still important for those who are, want to know the story of it. Right. And the, hopefully the cinematics for gamers is because it's going to drive you emotionally to continue to tell this story through your gameplay. Yeah, so it's interesting Like you made the correlation of like pinball, which is like analog, and like video, like which is, you know, digital. And so, because the thing is, you know, you talk to younger people, they don't know much about pinball. They'll think, oh, it's just cosmetic that it's a, it's a kiss pinball machine or a Batman pinball machine but no like there is audio that does tell the story and so I think almost like working backwards you understand that in any kind of game there's a storytelling element and that's what's like that's what it takes to get people in like if they don't know anything about the property well the visuals will get them in that's why machines have all the lights and whatever and so the because you know about voice acting like, it didn't really start to really happen in games until like the 90s and then people really just expected voice acting to be in games. And now it's to a point where it's the names that are in the games. Well, the voiceover thing has always been. You know, I'm going right. to disagree that it started in the 90s. It started way before then because you have to remember something. Everything is an expansion of something else. True. There isn't one thing that is in, it, in and of itself its own entity. Right. And what ended up happening is the cinematics became important because there were games that were made that had no cinematics because it was a shooting game. You had a goal in that game. Once you reached the game, the goal was over and the game was over. Right. Now you have expansions. Why? Expansions are so integral because of the characters and the relationships. So it's the story and the narrative that drives the game and not the reverse, which was something that was much earlier. Right. So that's a good point because now it's back when, before expansions, it was like once you were done with that physical disc or cartridge, you had to wait a few years to experience it again. And maybe you didn't have the console in which to experience it again. And so as you know, as you went from pinball, did you is there a time where you kind of started casually playing like, you know, no, you, I was never interested. So you so, I was never interested, I, but I'm the only thing that interests me are people who play. I love watching people play. Why? Because the coordination and the finesse it takes to connect from here to that is, I think, uh, uh, art. You know, I really see an artistry in it. And it's fascinating. Those people who have that kind of mind, that kind of skill, that kind of coordination, it's the same coordination as people in the military who, who fly drones. Right. Um, who fly planes. It's the same coordination that it takes to work heavy duty construction equipment. Um, and I know because I've actually had the opportunity to vicariously live and use heavy duty construction equipment um, and, and go, wow, I'm coordinating, I'm moving, dumping, I'm using the heavy duty equipment that's a couple of tons and I'm moving stuff. Yeah. And it was really amazing. Um, but I didn't have the finesse of it. So I had the rudimentary stuff, but not the finesse. And that's me. I live vicariously through those who have the finesse. And you get while more I joy know out of that. And I, more. Yeah. And, I, and I get more joy out of being able to tell the story that leads them to want to play even more. Right. You know? And, and so, now, the... I was curious. Like, I, cause I, I bumped into a Reddit thread that, I don't know if it's an inside joke, but people joked about how you are in multiple games. And it's your likeness. And the joke is like, is this the same character in multiple games? <laughs> is that... How is that to see yourself digitized in a game? Is I don't really think about it because the game developers and the game company are the ones who make that decision. I have nothing to do with it. Um, so I, I, I like to theorize that when I bring, uh, uh, when I hold that space of that being, that the game developers 
have a vision for it at that point. They have a vision that kind of suits my look because of my body language mm-hmm. and the voice print that I think comes with it uh, uh, in developing this, this, this being and having them become a real living being through me. Right. And I think it's up to them to go, yeah, I see the correlation and the body language and this speaks volumes and we want to make sure your face gets captured because as you speak and how you speak, it's really powerful and we want to make sure that that's seen and we don't want to do it any other way. That's what I was... So I've had that happen a number of times where it's oh. like we're going to, we have a different idea of this character and what they're going to look like and what's been sketched out and what's been animated and what's been graphically done. Right. But we're going to throw that all the way because when you bring something to the table, you're bringing the volume of not the voice, but um, everything about the, this being that we want to change and craft it to, to your look. That, okay, that, that, I'm, I'm glad, because that's a, I was curious about that. I didn't, I, I was. Cu- never my decision, never my idea. Okay, and so you, you just, I mean, I would, I mean, it's, I would feel like it's an honor to be like, okay, that you, you it bring is. so much to the table that like, they couldn't see it any other way. And so. Definitely an honor. Do you ever. Humbling honor. Do you ever, like, since you don't play the games, have you ever, you know, you, I know you say you, you are watched vicariously through, do you ever kind of trip out and like see like you remember when you recorded that line or like you remember when you or how do you like I, I, I remember those that? things but the reason how I process it is a, as, as a storyteller I don't process it as an actor I don't process it as a voiceover actress I process it as a storyteller I want to see the story and make sure that the sincerity is exactly that it, it was captured as it was when I was in the volume you know and so for me it's always about being the small thing in the middle of the picture that doesn't stand out that makes the picture look askew. Like you can have a beautiful picture, all the painting, it's oil, and then you have this mark there. And then it draws attention in a negative way. It draws attention that distracts you from the, the overall beauty of something. And so being able to tell the story is to sacrifice your voice and make sure that the narrative comes first. And when the narrative comes first, and you absorb all of that, become, dare I say, possessed by it, your voice print will follow. So there's no, like, a way you describe it, there's no ego to be like, no, I Leave need to door. be the, I'm, I'm Deborah Wilson, I need to be the marquee, or else don't do it this way, like, don't, like, so, it's Because good my thing is this, if you, if you start with your voice and end with your voice, that doesn't mean it fits the narrative. Mm-hmm. The narrative came way before I did, and it will be there long after I'm gone. When somebody was thinking about it, it's my job to be in a service industry to go, here's what I'm bringing to the table, and see if that fits where they were meant to be in what they created. Because when they create something, it's way without thinking about who's going to voice it. It's like, this is my story, and this is what I'm building. And as they continue to build and craft with a company or with themselves or with their colleagues, they have an idea of what the person they've crafted or what the being they've crafted is going to sound like. Mm-hmm. And sometimes they hear it and go, that's the voice I heard in my head. Not, I love your voice. Right. I hear your voice. They don't care about your voice. They care about the voice that was crafted in their head because their story is the most important. And so I always go about it as in, how do I serve you and make sure that your story is being told? the way you saw it in your head because there's nothing better than going, you know what, I envisioned this and I wanted it and it's exactly what I wanted. Mm -hmm. You know, I envisioned going out for this meal and it was as delicious as I thought it would be. It's exactly what I expected. There's nothing more satisfying. So for me, uh, it is a service industry. I'm making sure that your vision gets served because I know what I can do. I know what I can bring to the table, but it has to fit your vision. So what good is a voice as prolific as it is, as the actor is, is if it doesn't fit the fucking narrative. Right. What's the point? Because that's a, you know, that, that, that choice of words, service industry, because people might tend to look at anything in entertainment as just like, oh, they're entertainers. They are, they have whatever egos, they're above everything. But the fact that you look at it as you, you are serving the greater, the, the whole of the narrative of the story yes. and not like, oh, you wanted me this is how it's going to be and so for people to hear that you call it a service industry i think it's important because at the end of the day it's not like you bring a bunch of ego to the to the thing it is 
you would you understand that you are part of an of a team. Their story came first. Right. And it will always come first because they've been developing it for years. Most people who are developing these games that are coming out have been developing them for years. Mm -hmm. So who am I to come in and tell you the thing that you've been working on, the thing that is your baby, the thing that is important to you, the thing that is your heart, the thing that is your soul, the thing that was in your mind, the thing that was in your thoughts, the thing that was in your imagination, the thing that was in your creativity should come second to my fucking voice. What the fuck? Right. And so I'm glad that you hear that. There, there's no ego here. It is strictly you have if you are part of a team, understand that you are part of the team like your whatever you think you bring they appreciate it but at the same time it is you need to play you gotta play nice with others serve the experience that's what it really comes down to you have to serve the experience right and you so know? is there um a particular um, i think that's why i get hired a lot because people know that i'm there to serve the experience and that their 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 process is respected and their vision from when they first had it is 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 is, is my main goal. Right. And so that's a lesson. Like you And they don't hire me for just that, just because I go, hey, I'm gonna serve you. No, they hire you. They for... hire you they hire me because they know that my integrity for what I want to bring to the table to tell it at the end of the day. Cause put it this way, my philosophy is at the end of the day, you don't want to hear my voice, you wanna feel your story. But that's the way gamers are. At the end of the day, you don't want to hear my voice. You want to play a game that you feel immersed in and you see yourself in. You don't want to hear my voice in it. You want to see yourself and feel yourself in it. Because at the end of the day, the equation is how you feel. How it makes you feel. Not how I sounded. Nobody goes home and goes, well, it sounded like this. And that voice sounded like this. They go, man, these characters. And so they're interested in the relationships because that's all what we relate to. As human beings, it is a connective experience so that you are getting something out of it. And it's my responsibility in that humility space of this storytelling to make sure that you're getting fed by using my emotional scope of everything I've ever been through to help tell the story of the human condition. Because no matter what, even if it's an animal, even if it's a dragon, if it's a sentient being, a cryptid, if, if it is an inanimate object, the moment it speaks, it's considered for us as human and relatable. And that's how people can relate to a sponge that lives under a sea. And that's how people can relate to a mouse whose name is Mickey. Right. And that's how people can relate to dragons in Dungeons and Dragons, in orcs, in Blizzard. That's how people relate because their stories are so connected to the human journey that everyone who plays and even doesn't play has their story being told too. Right. It's so yeah. That you 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 hear it. It's it's more than just a voice being lent to a character. It is you want you you. It's something that you don't notice it's missing until you don't get it. And yes. If you know that something uh, uh, something is not being delivered with the sincerity or with the the, the how emotional the integrity. Right. The emotional integrity because you'll hear my voice last and the story first, and because of that, you'll hear my voice. Right. You'll hear my voice, because at the end of the day, again, you don't want to hear it, you want to feel it. Right. I guess just uh, so we can uh, wrap up, is, uh, is there anything under your chair, like a brand new car? Is it blow? Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> Hello, so. yes, actually, actually, I am a giver. Never let it be said that I never gave you anything. Look under your seat. There's a car. Yes, hello. There's an actual car. A Hot Wheels, which reminds me of Hot Wings. Mama loves Hot Wings. <laughs> okay, so I have to ask. So we're elder millennials, as we call ourselves. And so the the experience of whenever I felt like the heat between, not heat, but like at the height of SNL, I felt like Mad TV went tit for tat. Did, was there ever a rivalry being felt between them? That is that has always been a common question, and no, because everybody knew each other from from improv and sketch uh, working. So no, nobody cared. N none of the people that we knew or who knew us, uh, we met. No one cared. That wasn't that wasn't a thing. It's, all, yeah. it's a media thing. It was a media thing. Nobody cared. Because I, I you know what tripped me out. Seth Meyers' brother was. Josh Myers. TV. Yeah. And I always trip because they look identical. Yeah. I remember the Amber Crabby and uh, Fitch sketch 
where they were like shirtless and like being like meatheads at the store. Yeah. Like, he looks just like, is that the same Terrence person? Hill was on both. He was on both. He was, yeah, he was on Mad TV first. Terrence, uh huh. Yeah, he, he was the youngest, at one point, he was the youngest cast member. I think when Terrence was in the cast, I think he was 19 when he got hired. 19? Because he's a baby face. 19, or he was either, yeah, he was either 19 or 20, but he was under 21 when he got hired. Wow. Like, so is that a, um, how do you remember those? Like, that, was it like, did you ever, no, because you're in it. It's like being in, like, a storm. Mm. Did you ever feel, like, the cultural importance of Mad TV? No. And, like, it didn't feel that? Like, how did it feel? It was when- just fun because it was a pop culture send-up of, of Mad Magazine. So we were, uh, you know, it was, a, it was not a complete immersion of a, of a, of a reflection of Mad Magazine. But it was a pop culture send-up because, obviously, we, we licensed Mad from Mad Magazine. And so we just kind of pushed the envelope like they did. In fact, they did a Mad Magazine on Mad TV, and they tore us an asshole. They tore us a new asshole. But, like, you wouldn't have it any other way, though. Huh? Like, you wouldn't have it any other way. John, the late, great, and amazing, who I got a chance to have an, a, 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 a personal experience with, the late, great, fantastic, and amazing uh, John Ritter said, you're not famous until you've been in Mad Magazine. He didn't wow. say Time Magazine. <laughs> He didn't say Time Magazine, no, he, he didn't say Mad. Rolling Stone, he said Mad Magazine. You're not really famous until you've been parodied in Mad Magazine. Because, you know, that people, <coughs> you know, they separate that. They forget that that was a magazine that people, that that was like the people's height of comedy. Or but it's a generational comedy. thing. Right. So I think a lot of those who were watching Mad TV at that point were still younger than the generation that had been watching SNL. And, 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 and in between those who watched in living color so i think when mad tv came out um it was finding its own comedy audience that was a little bit of snl and a little bit of in living color and saw the mixture between the two in this one show yeah i remember the the very first episode of mad tv it was they were driving around in the truck just asking people could they act because they couldn't find yeah and it was like nobody cared nobody wanted to do the show it was so funny it was like hey do you want to act Hop in a truck, and they had a truck full of just like the cast members. Whores. Yeah. <laughs> I just, I mean, that stuck. Bill out. Lamar playing a, a a postal worker who just shot up a a, a post office. Yeah, it just jumped on to save himself. Yeah, like it. So, like, was there? I mean, typical question. Did do you look finally at like there's a character that you loved playing? Your Oprah is like. We were talking about on the way here, like the, when the, it's like, all right, this camera adds ten pounds. Yeah. It, 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 it was so it would hop fat back cam. and forth. Yeah, Oprah so, fat like, cam. So you would have to record that twice, right? Like, how, like, and so like. The, but but the real the real beauty to that is the editing. Right. It was That's seamless. That's the real beauty. It was it was seamless, and and being able to repeat those moves, which was no big deal for me, uh, because we were doing this, doing it again, do it again, do it again. Because like, so, yeah. she because at that point Oprah had got her own voice because you know. She was kind of mild mannered, but then she got her own voice, and she had a special way of delivering things, where she would sing it, and she would like flail yeah. her arms. And so, did anybody that you satire or parody or sent up ever not like what you did? Like, Oprah. She didn't oh, like wow. it. No. Uh, and again, this is the rumor mill. Okay. This is the scuttlebutt. This is the rumor mill. But um, the rumor mill is that she uh, she found it disrespectful. I. Well, I could. I mean, that was the height. Like Oprah was. It was felt like Oprah mania, but like it's it's. It wasn't just the. It wasn't just the. It wasn't just the portrayal. It was how she was being portrayed as well. And I get that. I think she felt hurt. Yeah, and so as an egomaniac and heavy in loving food and being a control freak and how you know. But it's it's that's the whole point. It was just fun. Now you're uh, the other one that sticks out to me is your Whitney Houston, like the what. When I watch things, when somebody nails something, I don't laugh. I just stand in shock like they kind of nailed it. And, like, your subtleties of portraying Whitney Houston, like, did she ever did she ever see Mad TV? I heard that um, she thought it was funny. I knew someone who was in uh, her service as a bodyguard, kind of like a bodyguard. No pun intended. Heard, no pun intended. <laughs> But I heard that uh, she thought it was humorous. Okay, I, I get curious about that. But then again, she was probably high. <laughs> I mean, she did. She had comical interviews with Barbara Walters. She's like, "Where's the receipts?" I'm like, "How yeah. can you not parody it? Like, it's yeah. so funny." With, and we did that the the 
that week because that happened on uh, I think that happened on a, a, a Friday or a Saturday. Oh, so you and by Monday we were like, all right, let's get write it up, write this up, write this up. Because it was, I mean, it was ripe for the taking. Yeah. How much time do we have left? I, this is. Uh, I mean, I don't know. Does it, like, is, it is it is it clicking down? Uh, okay, cool. I, we're we're doing it live. Um, so I, I guess to, you got any questions? I mean, I could. I don't. Uh, you, we're gracious. We we are very thankful that you gave us the time. Oh, Just little old us. This was a last minute thing. They they were like, hey, you guys want to do press at DreamHack? I'm like, and then we we're looking through the list, and then the second name we see is like Deborah Wilson, and then it was like. Oh wow, she does! Like we were just—it was all like it was a rush. Oh, right on. But um, so, do you? Uh, what's the? Yeah, I mean, you people ask the typical question, like, because at that, because you got to remember, there was a point where you could name every cast member of Bad TV because they were all good. Like, I felt like you and like Stephanie Weir, and uh, uh, and here's what I do: I do this every time, so I'm gonna have to do it with you too. Okay. It's not Stephanie Weir. Stephanie. 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 S -T Thank you for that. E P H N I E. Is, is it N I E? S T E. Yeah. P H N I E. Right? Yeah. There's no. Stephanie. There's it's no. Not, a. It's not Stephanie. Stephanie Weir. It's Stephanie Weir. Yeah. I, yeah. And I still do that with her name to this day. <laughs> I don't know why it drives me crazy. I just do it. Like, no, it's Stephanie. Stephanie Weir. Like you. It was the uh, Mo Collins. It was. You guys were. Mama Momo. You guys were. It, what I what I respect because I I was a child like all my comedy all my like sensibilities, I was just watching sketch com like Mad TV SNL and like Conan just watching that's what I got my jokes from, and like this is just like just to say, the the subtleties that you guys put behind your characters and the care like that it's not just jokes it is everything around the it's it's the it's the actions like. The characteristics, the mannerisms. And you know what? I think the coolest thing about, for me, on Mad TV, my, I think, the all-time favorite thing uh, in memory that I can think of for Mad TV when I look at it on an overall scale, essentially, is being fans of people's work. Like, Mo, she was more than someone I did the show with. Yeah. She was. I'm, I'm a fan of her work. God, that character. So I would stand around and watch her. It is so good. Stephanie Weir, <laughs> fan. Watch, watch her. Uh, and Alex Borstein, fan. Watch her. I so mean, I mean, it's there's nothing better than to know that you're on a show where you're really the fan of everybody's work. Because like, do, I mean, because I mean, you guys brought. I mean, it was. You guys have wildly different ways in which you approached your comedy, but yet. Not really. But it was all sketch and improv, and it was all pushing the envelope. But. but yeah. What made it so fun is to watch people's takes on things because they were the consummate professional that found the subtleties and nuances and broadness in it all. And that to me is fascinating and beautiful and powerful and amazing to watch. Mo could have the most broad character and then find the smallest of subtleties to this day. Uh, and that led to her uh, people recognizing her talent as a dramatic actress also because uh, she did a guest star appearance on um, Fear of the Walking Dead, which turned into a recurring role, which turned into a series regular. Wow. Fear of the Walking Dead. The show has uh, finished its final season, but she, it's, just, it's just a testament to how, to how phenomenal she is. Do you ever think, that's a great, um, great I have a question, because like people Alex Borstein, two Eddies. Yeah. Wow, I didn't think, because he's... Yes, for the Mars, marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Oh wow! Like so, because the thing is, people would take comedy actors and put them in a hole and never think they could, quote unquote, reach beyond that. Was that a thing that you, like, was that I don't say stigma, but like feeling like you kind of had to prove yourself to people, like, like, oh, you're just a funny person. You could never take on a dramatic role. No, I never had that because I I had already done stuff prior to Mad TV, um, film and theater in New York. And when I was on Mad TV, a, a dramatic film. So it was never an issue because I think it's much easier to jump from comedy into drama than for people who, who choose the drama path into comedy. And then when people started evolving what this really is, it, all it is is storytelling. So you can jump because it's all storytelling. It's how you tell the story. That's all it is. It's how you tell the story. Just hit me. You did Miss Cleo. Miss Cleo was based in L.A. Did she ever... Ever you ever meet her or talk to her about that? That 
her, your patrol of her? No, because she had passed away by then. She had left L.A. a long, 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 I, okay, long, I didn't know long time the timeline. Okay. Yeah, the timeline was different. Okay. Because um, that, I mean, you kids don't remember, like, that was the fun thing to say. No, call me now. Like, was, because, I mean, that was right for the taking. So, yeah. like, it was, I, I, I forgot the timeline of that. So, is there a, because, you know, we were curious about, you know her full name. Bonif, uh, Bonifa Jackson. Bonifa, Bonifa Latifa Halifa Sharifa Jackson. Was that based on anybody you knew, or how did that character come about? Uh, an improv twenty, uh, an improv ten years before Mad TV. Ten years. Yeah, wow. it was an improv in New York City. I was doing an improv with a group called um, Significant Others. It was an all women's comedy troupe, and uh, we were doing an improv. And somebody in the audience had a question. They said, "What is your name?" And I just said, "Bundy Philippe, Halle Fisher, for Jackson." But Mad TV evolved the character into being this ghetto fabulous character, which initially she wasn't because she was just born from an improv never really used again we were curious until we came until i came out here you know and then they were like okay came out here meaning in los angeles right and they said let's evolve this into something and the makeup team had an idea and the uh the wardrobe team had an idea and the writers had an idea and it wasn't until fourth season where she really took off so like so when you um, so was it like they knew you had that character in the bag or like did you present that character to them? Well, it was an improv. It was it was a part of a, an audition process. Oh, so anyway. you audition with that. And one. so yeah, and so it, it never really had gotten far with Mad TV. And one of the writers who had come in uh, said, "I really want to I really want to develop this." And I was like, okay, have at it. It's and, so, and what he came up with was absolutely genius and it was inspiring for the makeup and it was inspiring for the wardrobe and it was just it yeah because you gotta remember that was an era where showing my age that was the movie Baps had come out with um Halle Berry and so like and and Natalie Natalie DeSalle yeah and so that resonated like that depiction it was like we knew people like that and it was like it was one of those things where some people don't know that they're their presentation is just like, or the way they present things is just like the joy that people get out of just being around them. And so like, was it something that, I mean, did you have to, where they study that a character like that? Like you had to go out and no, like- No, because I mean, again, I didn't think about it in terms of another human being. And they gave you it the was ideas. Just a, it was just a matter of an improv right. where someone in the audience just went, hey, uh, what's your name? And that just came out. It just came out. And then from there, it was great. So now as I continue this improv in this moment, um, I'm just going to continue more of her because now she has a name. So she has a precedence now because she has a name, right. not just a, a, an exercise as in an improv. Now she has a name. So now she's becoming full fledged. And so when it came to Mad TV, it just didn't seem to fly until fourth season when a writer came in and said, I got you on this one. I get it. So that, I cool. get it. I really get it. That's and pretty cool. Where, and the, 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 it, it developed into something else. And I was like, oh, yeah, okay. Oh, I love this. Because as a writer develops something, it's always about how can we, how, how can we take it as far as we can and, oh, and build upon the narrative each time and telling her story for each sketch. And that's what he did. And it was brilliant. Well, it... We we enjoyed our time with the legend Deborah Wilson. We could talk forever because uh, she's much a part of our childhoods and our current lives because she is still lending her her lovely talents to everything. Like no, there's no slowing down with Deborah no. Wilson. No, it's only picked up and it will continue to pick up until the day I die. And we hope so because this you see it, this energy, this all this this radiance, everything. It's the it, the industry. It all needs it. And so it's great to meet you in person and then the energy that you put out on television, it is, it's here and you feel it. And so we're still looking at your podcast. We're here with the legend, Deborah Wilson, and um, we hope you enjoy your time in Dallas. I uh, will. I shall. I am. I already am. And so, yeah, um, thanks for your time and we'll, we'll see you on the next one. All right.